very happy you made it to Brazil and uh, you accepted our invitation to participate in the 30th Sao Paulo Biennial. And I would like to introduce you to the Brazilian public who maybe doesn't know your work so well. Uh, you are, were born in Canada, but you also have an American passport and a British passport. Uh, you live in New York today. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how, what was your trajectory over the last few decades? Sure. Well, I was born in, in Canada, in Toronto. I grew up in Montreal, mostly. And um, I went to uh, grad school in San Diego to do a M MFA in 1985, I think, and, um, and then I met my partner, Jason Simon, who was in the same program, and we went back to New York together, and uh, uh, that was 1988, and I've been in New York ever since. So. And uh, you, in San Diego, you were studying in the photography department? Yeah, it was, um, it was one of these programs that was very open, so you could you know, come in uh, as part of the photography department, but then I ended up working in film and video, and so kind of film, video, and photography, and working with different people. And what were you doing at the time when you started arriving in New York? Do you think your work changed uh, by being in the city? It actually did. There was quite a, a marked shift, I think, from, uh, you know, that, that moment when I arrived in New York because um, I felt I was at the beginning, really at the beginning of something. And uh, I had just, you know, gotten my MFA degree and that was three years of, of work. And um, I remember just thinking, uh, sort of thinking very hard, you know, what's, what's the most imp important thing to you right now or the most troubling thing to you right now? I asked myself that question. And, um, and it was money, it was my relationship to money. And so I decided I was, I was gonna make work about money. And um, it took different forms. I made a Super 8 film called Hell Notes, but then I made these photographs, which were close-ups of um, American currency, all the kind of little vignettes uh, the people, at the time there was actually a, a, a little car from 1910, like a Model T car, a Model T Ford on the $10 bill. So, and then I also photographed the Lincoln, the Lincoln head on the penny, but only very dirty and degraded and really messed up pennies. And, um, and I made a hundred of those. And, those. and those were shown quite a lot at the time. And then they, they were shown again in 19, uh, sorry, <laughs> 2010, or when, anyhow, like 20 years later, they were shown again. At the height of the Coincidentally, crisis, at the both times, it was a financial yeah. crisis in 1990, and then in 2008, 2009, it was also, yeah, but pure. But it was a pure coincidence, actually, that they were. <laughs> and uh, you photographed them with a very uh, big lens. Uh, yeah. Close -ups. Exactly. So what one sees in those images is really the graininess, the materiality, yeah. of the points. Yeah, they're they're totally transformed by the the close up. Uh, it's you see all you know. Some of them are barely recognizable as pennies, actually, because some of them are so encrusted and covered with dirt that it's almost like you're looking at a, a topographical map, and, and then you can kind of start to make out the profile of, of Lincoln. So, yeah, there, some of them are very abstract, actually, yeah. And then around about, not so much later, you also started to photograph newsstands in New York. Yeah. And that, that's a series which we are partly exhibiting here right. at the pavilion as part of the 30th biennial. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, that also started a preoccupation of yours of uh, wandering through the city and uh, mm -hmm. taking motives from around the urban uh, sprawl like in a kind of derived Sort yeah. Of way. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm I'm always interested in that kind of process, that 
process of chance and, and accident. And um, but in fact, it it um, it actually started by looking. I was looking at a book of photographs by uh, Aget, the French, you know, the French photographer from the 19th and early 20th century who photographed Paris, who uh, all the monuments and the buildings being torn down and um, uh, Eugène Naget. So I was looking at a book of his photographs and he had some pictures of newsstands actually. And I was, um, I decided I was gonna do my own version of newsstands in color uh, in New York. Uh, his were in black and white obviously. Well, actually, my necropolis is a lot about my relationship to Paris, to the city of Paris, um, because I was there when I was very young, when I was 18, and then I returned, you know, much later. Um, and so I was, uh, I was thinking a lot about the, the, the city and a lot about memory and about, um, and there's also a kind of very much a sort of derive thing that happens in, in my necropolis, just this kind of wandering through the famous and not so famous cemeteries of Paris and um, coming upon the graves of all kinds of people. But the ones that, um, that I photographed were uh, either the graves of writers or graves that had books on them because I, I began to see that that was a very common motif in uh, French cemeteries was the, the, the book, the, the stone book. And, um, but the well, the, the first and foremost, I was thinking about Walter Benjamin, actually, and uh, so the, the video is kind of in two parts, and one part is um, where I'm just asking friends to interpret a very mysterious line from a letter he wrote about a clock that he could see from his study, and he says, more and more, this clock becomes a luxury. I find it difficult to do without. And, so I just ask all kinds of people, including my 12-year-old son and, and my partner, Jason, to give me their interpretations. And the things they say are just kind of all over the map. Um, you don't ever see any pictures of them. You just see their graves. Um, there's Gertrude Stein is there. Felix Guattari is there. Um, Colette, you know, like many of, many of the famous ones. Susan Sontag's grave is there. Um, but it was also an opportunity, it was an opportunity to go to the really famous cemeteries, the big ones, Père Lachaise and um, Montparnasse, but then also all the little tiny village cemeteries that um, there's maybe eight or nine of them all together. And those are really interesting as well. And at the same time, you and Jason uh, in upstate New York, you were also uh, running, initiating 10 years ago, the One Minute Film Festival. Yes. Uh, in a uh, barn? In a barn near uh, Narrowsburg, New York. It's two hours uh, from the city. And how did that start? That started, actually we, we got this place, we built this barn, so we had this huge empty space. And, um, and it was a conversation actually between Jason and Mark Dion and J. Morgan Pewitt. And they were just sort of saying, what should we do with this space? And they came up with this idea to do a one minute film festival. And so we, we just, we started doing it. And um, so we just started inviting people to make a one minute film and to either come or to mail it in. And we would have, you know, food and, and, thing, and drink and, would be a party, kind of starting around four or five o'clock, and then at sundown, Jason would project all of these movies. And in the beginning, it was kind of interesting because most of the movies were on little mini DV cassettes, and and gradually, uh, and he actually he notes this in, in a little text that he wrote because it's going to be there's going to be a little book about it. You know, in the course of those ten years, the technology just shifted so radically to the point where 
we were getting the movies emailed to us as files. And, um, and how many people more would participate in the festival? A lot. Festival? I mean, it was uh, on average about 100 people would come. And, uh, and some people would camp and people, you know, or stay nearby. Or, and then the last one was, was a little bit different. It was an exquisite corpse. Um, so that, Jason and I worked on that for about a year and a half before, you know, before the event, compiling this thing. So we had somebody make the first segment, 60 seconds, and we gave the last seg second to the next person, and they added their one minute, and then, and, you know, so on. And so we ended up with a 63-minute uh, movie. Uh, it's pretty great. <laughs> Great. And that's what we're going to show here, yeah. Oh, you saw it, yeah. <laughs>